Good afternoon. Welcome to Braca Strong Live. I'm so honored to have Dr. John Diaz here today, who will be speaking about ovarian cancer survivorship. So let's give him a minute to tune in. But I wanted to thank everybody that participated in our mammogram event this Saturday, which happened. So honored that Braca Strong was able to fund 19 women mammograms. So again, we're so honored that we were able to do that this Saturday. Hey, Dr. Diaz, welcome. How are you? Hello. Hey, Dr. Diaz. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. Nope, you're going in and out. All right, let me see if I can get on our Wi-Fi here. Okay. So for those of you who are just tuning in, as we are getting ready to talk about our ovarian cancer survivorship today with Dr. John Diaz, who comes on frequently and works with BRCA Strong, educating the community on ovarian cancer, on genetic mutations that deal with ovarian cancer, and just gynecological cancers in general, because we focus um, you know, just not the BRCA gene, regardless of predisposition. There's still cancers out there that need to be spoken about. So that's what we're here to do. So thank you so much, Dr. Diaz, for joining us this morning and taking the time out of your patients and clinic to educate the community. No worries. How's that, Tracy? Can you hear me a little better? Perfect. Great. Okay. So as we're getting started, I'd just like to thank everybody again for being a part of Brock is Strong. And today happens to be Fact Friday. And the facts that we want to make sure we continue to pass on. And every Friday, we have started something new here at Brock is Strong with different facts. And this morning's facts were just how Brock is Strong is making such an impact in our community. And as a grassroots organization, I really want to make our community aware of what we have and the women that we're helping. So if anybody's out there that saw our post this morning and has any questions on our programs, feel free free to reach out to myself through a message or one of our board members. But once again, I'd like to welcome Dr. Diaz for our ovarian cancer survivorship, you know, communication this morning, just sharing with our community, you know, the different updates and what's happening in our community with ovarian cancer. Thanks, Trace. Thanks again for organizing this and everything you do for our community. So today we're going to do a little bit uh, of a different topic. You know, usually we talk about um, ovarian cancer or the association between ovarian cancer and the BRCA genes and, and things of that nature. And so today, Tracy asked me to kind of take a different approach, which was talk a little bit about survivorship. And this is uh, Cancer Survivorship Month. And so I'm going to try to do my best uh, to tackle that topic, which is a really important topic that we don't really get taught a lot about this uh, in medical school, residency, or fellowship. And I think probably because it's a little bit of a new concept, the idea of um, Ooh, we lost. diagnosis. You got me back? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, you know, what is cancer survivorship and when does that start? Uh, and I think that starts from the time of diagnosis and it continues on for their patients rest of their lives. Uh, and the challenge, you know, is we're learning more and more about that because thankfully our treatments are getting better and patients are living longer. So when you look at GYN cancers, there are over a million women uh, who are, are cancer survivors at this time. Uh, and that makes up about 10% of the cancer survivors in the United States. Um, and over the next decade, that should increase by another 33%. So thankfully we're getting a lot more cancer survivors. That means we're doing a better job of early detection uh, and treatment for these patients. And so when you think of survivorship, there are kind of different things that you have to think about. Um, the first thing that always comes to mind is prevention, right? How do I prevent this cancer from coming back? How do I prevent a new cancer um, from forming? And that's done through surveillance, you know, the follow up that you do with your physician and depending on what kind of cancer, uh, the type of exam that you're doing, sometimes it's blood work, CT scans. Um, and part of survivorship is evaluating your cancer, your cancer treatment options, 
and what those side effects are, what those side effects are going to be acutely and what the long-term side effects are this are going to be. And once we're done with treatment, how do we coordinate that, right? So you're so invested uh, with your oncologist, you see them um, so often, and then comes the point you say, okay, well, I'll see you again in three months. And it's like, well, what do you mean three months? I've been seeing you every couple of weeks for the last six months. And so how do we kind of coordinate that care with your primary care doctor and your other physicians who take care of you that you kind of need to uh, do with that? So I think the biggest thing is surveillance. It's the one that we kind of associate more with survivorship. And it's one of the most important aspects, right? How do we follow patients and make sure that uh, this cancer doesn't come back or if it does come back, that we catch it uh, in time. Um, and the other thing that we have to have a discussion with our patients is what is part of that surveillance? What does that entail? Um, what are the risks of surveillance, right? So, you know, everything we do has certain risks. Um, and then what are the limitations? You know, um, we all wish that there was a test that could tell you this is when cancer has come back. Um, but it's a little bit more subtle than that. Uh, it's interesting, last night I was on uh, Univision talking about a new uh, blood test that's looking at cell-free DNAs um, in cancer patients and that it's able to earlier detect a recurrence than some of the traditional methods we use with other two markers like C125 or, or CT scans. And so that looks promising. Uh, the question is, okay, so if we identify it earlier, does that change outcome? And we don't have those answers yet. And the surveillance part is so important because most recurrences, when they happen, they happen in the first two to three years of you completing your treatment. So when you look at endometrial cancer, if that cancer is going to come back 75% of the time, it comes back in the first two to three years. Um, cervical cancer, kind of the same thing. Uh, ovarian cancer, we know patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer, we're able to put them into an initial remission, and that's great. And now with the use of PARP inhibitors, we're able to extend that initial remission. Um, but we know that about 75 to 80% of those women with advanced stage, um, that cancer uh, is going to come back and that usually happens again uh, in the first two years. So that surveillance is so important. Um, the challenge, again, is understanding the limitations. So, you know, I'll look at ovarian cancer, uh, the blood test, the CA1E25 test, which everyone is very familiar with. A lot of my patients will just tell me, oh, that blood test detects cancer, and we have to kind of go about what CM25 can or can't do. But there was a great study done in Europe, and I talked to all my patients about this. And what they did was they took women who had ovarian cancer, and they had completed their treatment, and they randomized them. In other words, they put women in different groups. Um, one group were women who had a blood test drawn every three months, like we do in the United States, and that blood test was then used as part of the decision-making on when did you do something else, some other intervention, a CT scan or start treatment or something like that. The other group of women uh, did not get that blood test every three months. And instead, those women were followed uh, and based on their symptoms or clinical exams, then they would get a CT scan and start on chemotherapy. And what they found was when you looked at these two groups of women, those who had their regular cm 125s and those that did not, um, there was no difference in their outcomes. In other words, those women who we were following routinely with CA125s, and by you know finding this elevation, we'd obviously would start chemotherapy earlier and intervene earlier. That early intervention didn't translate into longer survival. What it did translate into is more time on chemotherapy and less quality of life scores. So it's a great study, uh, but we don't follow that study. You know, good luck telling a patient in the United States that you're not going to get her CA125. Um, I do tell this story to patients when their CM25 starts to creep up and explain to them, hey, these are the limitations of what we have. And that's why I say part of that surveillance is understanding what we can or can't do and also understanding that limitation. So that early intervention, that rising CM125 doesn't necessarily translate into better outcomes. And so with that new test I talked about yesterday on the news uh, with the cell-free DNA, okay, it's great that we can identify this early. The question becomes, does that early identification translate into improved outcomes for our patients? And so that's part of the things that we have to understand. Maybe we don't do a great job sometimes of explaining to our patients, all right, this is what we're going to do with surveillance, uh, but these are limitations of what we can do. Even CT scan, PET scans, all those things do have uh, false negatives. In other words, it's a negative scan, but maybe something's going on, and also false positive rates. In other words, it finds something that's active that may not be related to your cancer diagnosis. And so that's those things that we have to kind of 
uh, work with the limitations of it um, and educate our patients that sometimes don't understand, well, why can't you just do the blood test and find the cancer? Uh, and that's not really how it always works. Um, but that's part of that shared decision-making with your patients and part of survivorship, you know? And so that's one of the biggest stressors. Uh, when patients know, okay, I got my appointment coming up with John, and I have to have my CT scan, and then I have to wait five days before I see him before I get my CT result. Uh, and that's when a lot of anxiety builds for our patients. And that's normal. Um, but it's something we have to also recognize as providers that that's happening. Um, one of the other things. Anxiety. Uh, yeah, anxiety. We'll yeah, anxiety is real. <laughs> anxiety is real. Um, and I understand. And, um, and the other challenge now is with portals. You know, portals are great. Patients have access to their records and their scans, but sometimes they have access to stuff uh, maybe before even their physician saw it. Uh, and maybe before that, but to talk to their physician about it. So, you know, before the days of portals, when patients would call and ask uh, for the CT results and, and my nurse practitioner would ask me, well, what do you want me to do? I said, that's their results. You know, they can give it to them. Um, then they'll probably see me tomorrow. I may not have time this afternoon to answer all the questions that comes up in that CT scan. So a little bit of a double-edged sword. You're getting this information and you're seeing sometimes scary words on these scans, um, but you're seeing it without maybe the help of your oncologist help you digest what it means or doesn't mean. Um, so the portals are great. Um, but it is a little bit of a double-edged sword. And I have patients tell me, hey, listen, I won't go on that portal until I see you. And I know we're going to go to the scan together. And then I can look and see what it says. I have other patients that will text me right away. My CT is in. Did you see it? I said, no, I'm in the operating room. You just had your CT this morning. No, I haven't seen it yet. Um, so it cuts both ways sometimes. So the other part that's important about survivorship is getting on with some of the side effects from your cancer treatment. Um, and... You know, one of the things that can help with this, and we talk about this all the time when we talk about it, is physical activity, exercise. It's so important um, for so many things. Um, but engaging regular physical activity, study and study has shown that that helps get you back to your regular self. It helps decrease the morbidity from your treatment, be that the surgery you had, the chemotherapy, radiation. Physical activity really is paramount to getting you back to yourself. Um, and we do a terrible job at it, both physicians and patients. So when you look at patients with endometrial cancer who have completed their treatment and are now kind of, you know, back to their regular life, only about 12% of women with endometrial cancer actually complete the minimum requirements for uh, weekly exercise. So only about 15% get their 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. Um, and as we know, one of the risk factors for endometrial cancer is being uh, overweight. And so a lot of times I tell my patients who have gone through a surgery and they're willing to endure all of these things to treat and prevent their endometrial cancer. And I tell them, I said, you know, you're most likely to die from cardiac disease than you are from your endometrial cancer. Um, and so if you're overweight, we got to talk about diet. We got to talk about exercise. And those things are hard. They're, they're not a pill. Um, but it's the one of the most important things you can do to prevent these cancers, and once these cancers come, to prevent them from coming back and get you back to feeling yourself. One of the more common symptoms that patients talk about in survivorship is fatigue. And a lot of things can cause the fatigue. It can come from fatigue from the chemotherapy you received, just emotional exhaustion. Um, and again, one of the best things to help battle this fatigue is regular exercise, right? Uh, and pushing yourself a little bit when you're just feeling like you don't want to do anything you don't go to a marathon, you don't go to do a CrossFit section, uh, but you got to get out there and walk the block for 15, 20 minutes and do that a couple times a week. And then after a month, you can increase that to 30 or 45 minutes and then little by little. But that initial inertia, once you get over it, that's the best treatment for your fatigue. And then, like we talked about, coordinating your care back to your regular doctor. So let's make sure that there are other things that are causing this fatigue. So if you have other underlying, you know, heart disease, kidney disease, your thyroid function off. And so we're so focused during the cancer treatment with treating the cancer, and rightfully so. But once we're done, we got to look back and say, okay, where am I globally from my health standpoint? And how do I partner with my primary care doctor? Because I understand everything that was done for my cancer treatment, but make sure I, I deal with all my regular routine um, health issues. And then we one of the other things that's real. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. We have a question. Yeah. So I recently started seeing a new oncologist at MSK, she strongly advised that I, I not have a prophylactic mastectomy. 
I can't open the rest of it. Can you, do you see it on your side, Dr. Diaz? No, I don't. Kamali, so I only see that it says she strongly advised that I do not have a prophylactic mastectomy. Can you send the rest in another question for me, please? Sorry about that. Go ahead, Dr. Diaz, and then when yeah, it comes no back. Worries. That's okay. So one of the other things that's really common that patients complain about, it's a real thing, is chemo brain. You know, that cognitive dysfunction that patients get after, most commonly, chemotherapy. So that chemo brain is a real thing. And how do we treat that? And so, again, one of the things is exercise helps with chemo brain. The other thing is to kind of maintain yourself uh, mentally active. So doing things that are mentally challenging, be it the Sudoku or crossword puzzles or, you know, kind of getting back to your regular work schedule and not getting frustrated with yourself when your short term memory is acting up um, because those things are real. They do get better, but we do need to improve with cognitive behavior. So all those things kind of roll into the survivorship of ovarian cancer. So she wrote, she didn't have a, that her physician suggested she didn't have a prophylactic mastectomy until she finished the Linparza. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming this is a patient with probably uh, ovarian oh, cancer. 3C, I believe. With a BRCA mutation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as you know, patients with ovarian cancer uh, do have a risk of having a genetic mutation that put them at that risk. And the most common one is the BRCA mutation, which is part of that hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. And so if we identify that, that's a good thing. Um, in patients who don't carry an ovarian cancer diagnosis, you know, we often recommend risk-reducing strategies. And one of those risk-reducing strategies for women is to potentially have a prophylactic mastectomy. In other words, remove healthy breast tissue before a cancer has started to prevent that cancer. Oftentimes, women with an ovarian cancer diagnosis who are now diagnosed with a BRCA mutation, um, instead of jumping right into a risk-reducing surgery, um, they're often asked to wait uh, a period, and depending on the gestation, be anywhere from two to three years. And the thought behind this is kind of what we talked about before, you know, um, that's uh, potentially a big surgery. Um, unlike ovarian cancer, we do have um, screening for breast cancer. And so we do have an ability to try and catch a breast cancer early. Um, some of the medications or chemos that we use for breast cancer similar to ovarian cancer. So if you've had adjuvant chemotherapy, potentially any abnormal cells in the breast could have also been treated with that. Um, and because the rate of ovarian cancer recurrence, um, you know, is a little bit high, oftentimes they want to wait to maybe clear that initial period that we talked about of survivorship those first two, three years, um, just to make sure that your ovarian cancer hasn't come back. Because um, obviously, if it does, that would be the more pressing issue of treating that known ovarian cancer versus a uh, pretty big surgery to reduce the risk of a potential cancer in the future. So that's why a lot of times the breast oncologists or the breast surgeons would recommend for a patient with a newly diagnosed ovarian cancer to undergo a period of about two years of surveillance to make sure that the ovarian cancer will come back and then proceed with you know, what potentially can be a pretty big surgery that requires uh, oftentimes several procedures between the initial surgery and then potential reconstruction and whatnot. So before jumping into that, a lot of times I'll recommend, and rightfully so, to initiate that initial surveillance period, uh, make sure the variant cancer you know, hasn't come back and then proceed with that surgery. And that's also part of survivorship, you know, getting all of our patients with ovarian cancer, breast cancer should be offered genetic counseling and possibly genetic testing and if you do find one of these mutations, that also changes, you know, your surveillance for a new or different cancer. So one lady asked, how do you treat tremors that was brought on by chemo? Yeah, that can be pretty challenging. And so, again, one of the, the issues with chemotherapy is it can cause a lot of side effects. You know, neuropathy, where you get that numbness of your hands and your feet, is pretty common with the drugs that we use, particularly in GYN cancers, with the taxane, so like paclitaxel, and even carboplatinum can add to that. So um, one of the important things when I tell my patients is I'm going to see you every three weeks before your treatments, and we're going to ask you how you're doing, and I want you to tell me how you're doing. You know, a lot of times patients don't want to complain because uh, they don't want you to decrease the dose or stop the medication, things like that. But I tell them, if you don't tell me, 
you know, then I can't do anything about it. We have treatment options to help reduce some of the side effects. You know, it's hard to get through a chemo with no side effects. But we can certainly do a better job of managing them if we partner together and you tell me what's going on. And I can either add a medication, change the dose, change the schedule, and different things like that to try and reduce some of those side effects. So um, different things can bring on tremors. Uh, it really depends on kind of what the onset was, what chemos you were. And so, you know, partnership with your oncologist, maybe a referral to a neurologist to see what uh, can be done for this. All right. Second question. What is the data on the ovarian cancer reoccurrence for BRCA2, or are we just lumped into the data for all women? Yeah. So that's a great question. And a lot of it depends on when you were diagnosed. In other words, you know, kind of what stage and are you on maintenance therapy? So ovarian cancer um, is treated with chemotherapy and surgery. And depending on what's going on, depends on which one you do first. Um, ovarian cancer, as you know, when it presents, it usually presents at an advanced stage about 85% of the time. The good thing about ovarian cancer is it's very responsive to chemotherapies. And so if you are presenting at an advanced stage, you still, still have a really good chance over 85% of women are put into an initial remission. And if you carry a BRCA mutation, while that increases your risk of developing ovarian cancer, it also makes you a lot uh, better responding to the treatments that we use. So before PARP inhibitors, we knew that patients with BRCA mutations responded well or better to carboplatin than those patients weren't. And so you know, we would publish a lot of our data from Sloan Kettering with great outcomes. And a lot of times people say, well, but you have a very uh, enriched Jewish population with a high number of BRCA patients, and that's why your patients do better than other published data from other institutions. Uh, and there may be some truth to that. And now with the understanding of PARPs and PARP inhibition, we know that patients who carry that BRCA mutation do really well uh, with PARP inhibitors. So if you are a newly diagnosed ovarian cancer patient and you're placed into an initial remission, and you carry a BRCA mutation, uh, you should be offered maintenance therapy. And that maintenance therapy can be with a PARP inhibitor or a PARP inhibitor in combination with another medication called bevacizumab. Uh, and the progression-free survival, in other words, from the time you finish your treatment to when the cancer returns or what's called your treatment-free survival. So from the time you finish this to the time you have to start new chemotherapy, with these PARP inhibitor in combinations uh, has increased from you know anywhere from 12 to 15 months uh, to, you know, two, three years beyond. So patients with BRCA mutation, if you're a PARP inhibitor maintenance after initial therapy, you know, your um, survival has really improved over the last several years. And when you talk about survival, you know, has improved, you know, maybe you want to go back to like five years ago and maybe you know some data to now, like on how women are surviving. Like, is there any stats out there on the survivorship of ovarian cancer that you could share with us? Yeah, so, you know, the challenge with ovarian cancer is the overall survival data, right? So when you look at cancer, you look at two things. You look at what's called progression-free survival. And progression-free survival is from the time point that you either were diagnosed or you finish your treatment, depends on what the study wants to call it, to the point where maybe that cancer comes back. And at that point, you're going to be treated with something else. Versus overall survival is from the time point that you were diagnosed until... Um, you know, the time point where patients um, pass. And so we can have improvements in progression-free survival that haven't yet reached to improvements in overall survival because we just don't have that long-term data. Um, and so that's kind of the difference. And so certainly the survival now for ovarian cancer with the use of PARP inhibitors, with the use of bevacizumab, with the incorporation of HIPEC is much, much better than it was uh, certainly 10 years ago and even five years ago. You know, it's only been in the last couple of years that we've really moved PARP inhibitors from treatment at time of third progression or initial recurrence to upfront. Um, and it's really changed the landscape for ovarian cancer. Um, and, and I joke with some of my younger partners that, you know, you guys are getting spoiled. We had all these positive trials for ovarian cancer with PARP inhibitors. It's been such a great, um, great last couple of years with ovarian cancer research that um, now we think every trial is going to be positive. And unfortunately, we know that's not the case. So survival for ovarian cancer has really improved over these last uh, five to 10 years. And I think it's only going to get better as we understand disease more and we get new drugs. You know, and as we talk about, you know, new medications coming to market, maybe you want to talk a little bit about, 
your position and what you do with clinical research and why it's so important that we have women involved in trials, you know, of all different nationalities, all different ethnicities, you know, to collect this data. And one thing that we've spoken about in the past, and I probably try to take based on every call is, you know, why is it important for women who not only are ovarian cancer survivors, um, obviously, so we can help survivorship and extend that, like women with the BRCA gene mutation or another genetic mutation, you know, the purpose behind clinical trials, as you and I know, is to collect data so we have more new medicines, new technology. Like from a physician standpoint, like how can we encourage our women to join these trials? Yeah. So um, I think the landscape in South Florida has really changed over the last five years. Um, so, you know, I'm, um, Born and reared in South Florida, uh, South Florida is my home. I had the opportunity to go to Sloan Kettering for fellowship and loved it. Um, but one of the challenges was to see the, you know, the quality of care in New York compared to South Florida. Um, and so coming back home uh, and being part of Sylvester Cancer Center for a couple of years and now joining the team at MMA Cancer Institute, you know, it's the first time since 1970 Sylvester opened that we have a second cancer center in South Florida. When you look at most major cities, they have numerous institutions. So this is great for Miami. Competition is good. Um, here at the Miami Cancer Institute, I lead the clinical research efforts for uh, GYN Oncology. And it's been great. You know, we're member alliances with Sloan Kettering. And so what that means for the South Florida community is um, we get to bring the clinical trials that are offered in New York right here to South Florida. So, you know, if you had money in South Florida and you got sick, you could afford to fly to New York or Boston or MD Anderson. Um, but for the rest of us, you know, South Florida's a home. That's where we stay. So we got our treatment and things were kind of limited in the past. But now we've really had a flourishing of the number of clinical trials that are offered to our patients. And the reason that's so important is, you know, PARP inhibitors, for example, have revolutionized the treatment of ovarian cancer. And I was lucky enough to be, as a fellow, part of the first phase one trial of inhibitors up at Sloan Kettering. That was 14 years ago. That's how long it takes from a phase one drug to get to market. Uh, and so now, right now, you know, at Miami Cancer, we have phase three trials on ovarian cancer. Uh, we have phase two trials and we have phase one trials. So our patients who have this diagnosis have the opportunity of really cutting edge clinical trials and have access to these drugs that may not come to market for another 10 to 15 years. And we know patients who enroll in clinical trials do better. Um, they do better because now it's not just your one physician that might be managing your cancer. You're being managed usually by someone, an expert in the field, if they have an interest in clinical trials. It's a whole clinical trials team that's following you. They're very specific and rigid um, guidelines as far as lab work, when CT scans need to be done, how to interpret the CT scans. So Patients who enroll in clinical trials, even if the drug ultimately turns out not to be a benefit, do better than those patients who are not in clinical trials. And the reason it's so important is, you know, breast cancer is one of the more common cancers in women. And so we have a lot of patients with breast cancer. We have a lot of women that could enter into clinical trials for breast cancer. There are only 22,000 ovarian cancers a year in the United States. So one of the biggest challenges to conducting clinical trials in ovarian cancer is we just have a limited number of patients available. And so you also have a limited number of dollars available for these trials. You know, women's cancers are one of the most poorly funded research cancers in the United States, and that's a shame. And so things we can do is to make sure to look for an expert in the field if you get diagnosed with a GYN cancer, any cancer for that matter, and then be sure to support people in politics, congressmen, senators that support research for cancer, particularly for women's cancer. Again, uh, prostate cancer is one of the best funded cancers in the United States. Uh, men don't die from prostate cancer. Men die with prostate cancer, but they get funding because they're men. Versus women's cancers, ovarian cancer, endometrial, cervical are some of the worst funded research uh, cancers in the United States. So we need to be vocal. And I always talk about, you know, they're great advocacy programs like BRSA Strong, um, as well as Fresh for Women's Cancers. All these things help to bring our uh, attention to these cancers to the decision makers that control uh, funding. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing all this information about 
ovarian cancer survivorship and we get so many questions you know often we focus on all these other cancers but i'll never forget the first time he spoke and he told us you know the 22,000 women and they just kind of give me a different perspective on ovarian cancer as my grandmother did die with ovarian cancer so for me you know it hits close to home and i obviously as an advocate in the community for BRCA strong you know i want to make that difference and with i think knowing the stats of ovarian cancer and it's the lowest funded cancer i mean we have to make a difference so the only way we're really going to make a difference is by educating and taking the time out to do that because our voices need to be heard our ovarian cancer survivors you know anything we can do to help you get you in clinical trials make advancements you know we're always here for you and able to guide you to the right physicians. You know, if you're not in Miami and there's other places you need to be seen, there's different centers, we'd be more than happy to connect you with those. I know Dr. Diaz has taken the time and connected two of our women in New York and they're both in remission right now. So we're super thankful for everything, you know, that you've done, whether it's here, or whether it's out of state. And if you're out of state and you need to come see Dr. Diaz, you can feel free to contact us also as we have some partnerships with pilot programs to bring women to centers like Dr. Diaz to fly them, to participate in clinical trials, to have the most updated current medications that you can have to get you through and become a survivor. Um, there is one more question, Dr. Diaz, that came in. Dr. John, what are your thoughts on HIPEC as the first option to treat ovarian cancer, previously known as all right, I'm going to let you read that. Can you see that question? Because I definitely I don't want to sound yeah. it out wrong. <laughs> yeah, so the question is the role for HIPEC um, for the treatment of ovarian cancer. So I've talked about HIPEC before on your programs, Tracy, as you know. Mm -hmm. HIPEC stands for heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And the thought is at the time of surgery, if you're able to get all of the cancer out, can you do a chemotherapy bath at that time? Um, so that you're getting chemotherapy directly to the surfaces that ovarian cancer impacts, and you're getting chemotherapy right then and there in the moment of surgery when we know the disease burden is the lowest, and we know chemotherapy works best at that time point. Additionally, by heating that chemotherapy, the drugs we use, which are platinum, specifically cisplatinum, kind of changes the way it interacts um, with the human body at that point. So uh, I think HIPIC, uh in the appropriately selected patients in an experienced center um, like ours uh, is an appropriate treatment. And so there was a trial from the Netherlands a few years ago that demonstrated patients who had ovarian cancer, who received chemotherapy up front and then were taken to the operating room. If they received the HIPEC at that surgery, they did better, both a progression-free and overall survival benefit. This was published in New England Journal Medicine. That same group is now doing an international trial looking at using HIPIC at the very beginning. So if you have that initial surgery because you're a candidate for surgery, um, then you would get HIPIC at that time point. Again, it makes sense. Um, we just got to prove it. A lot of things in medicine make sense until we look at it and find out, well, maybe not so smart as we think we are. Um, but I think there's enough data to demonstrate that women with ovarian cancer benefit from intraperitoneal chemotherapy. There's enough data to show that HIPIC has a role in the treatment of ovarian cancer, that it's safe, and that it potentially can improve outcomes for women. So uh, I do lead the HIPIC efforts here at Miami Cancer Institute, both for ovarian cancer and other disease sites. Um, so I'm a little biased in that respect. Um, but I think it's a great tool um, that should be used, that should be used more for the treatment of ovarian cancer. Two questions as we're closing out. First question is, and I don't know if you could answer this, but I'm going to throw it at you. So I posted yesterday, um, the BRCA gene isn't just about ovarian and breast cancer. And we got a lot of feedback and I posted, and one cancer that a lot of women posted on was the peritoneal cancer. And I know we've spoken about it before, but maybe if you could give like a little bit of a definition and how it goes with the BRCA or the, sure. or the most, or the most common mutation to like GYN risks with either BRCA1 or BRCA2, because I think there's a lot of misconception I'm learning, like, in what, you know, when we talk about BRCA1 and BRCA2, people are like, oh, breast and ovarian cancer. I'm like, no, it is way more than that, guys. Like, there's so mm -hmm. much more to it. And yesterday I posted, and I got a lot of feedback, and one of them was the peritoneal cancer. And I'm like, interesting, Dr. Diaz is coming on today, and maybe you can just take a second to address it. And then when you're done to close out, if you could give women, as a GYN oncologist yourself, two pieces 
of advice on what we can do to help women to prevent it due to the no screening for, you know, no early detection for ovarian cancer, what would they be? Yeah. So um, I know we've talked about this a lot and I think it's great. <laughs> and I think um, because we talk about it so much, we come, sometimes think that what everybody knows everything we talk about, Tracy, we talk about all the time, but um, your constant presence, your constant posting and sharing goes to show that we still have a lot more people to reach. And it's so much information we throw out these sessions that it's good to go mm -hmm. over it again. So with a BRCA mutation, you're at increased risk of developing breast cancer, right? Mm -hmm. From a GYN standpoint, you're at increased risk of developing ovarian cancer. Now, ovarian cancer kind of encompasses three different things. Ovarian cancer encompasses a cancer that starts in the ovary. Ovarian cancer encompasses a cancer that starts in the fallopian tube. And over the last 10 years, we've learned a lot of what we used to think was ovarian cancer actually is starting in the fallopian tube. It's just at the time of surgery, you see this mass there and you can't really tell where it's coming from. But when we start doing uh, additional evaluations, we're seeing that a lot of ovarian cancer really is fallopian tube cancer. But we kind of lump it the same, we treat it the same. Um, they're both allowed to the same clinical trials. So when we talk about ovarian cancer, under that umbrella is the ovaries, is the fallopian tubes, and is also the peritoneum. So the peritoneum is the inside lining of your body. And the best example I give for patients to understand this is we think of your body as a garbage can. Think of your intestines and all that stuff as the garbage and think of the peritoneum as the garbage bag. So what's that lining? Um, it's really, you're not able to remove all of that peritoneum at the time of a risk reducing surgery. And so patients who have uh, BRCA mutation and we remove their ovaries and their fallopian tubes, it's not 100% that they're not gonna develop an ovarian cancer. And it's not 100% because of that primary peritoneal cancer which presents like, behaves like, and we treat it like ovarian cancer. Now, the likelihood of a woman developing a primary peritoneal cancer with a BRCA mutation is less than 1%, but it's not zero. And part of my counseling, anytime I talk to a patient about risk-reducing surgery is to stress the fact that it's not 100%. Um, and it's not to worry patients, but it is for them to understand that, heaven forbid, um, in a few years, they present with a uh, quote unquote ovarian cancer. And they say, well, John, how do I have an ovarian cancer? I took my ovaries out. And I said, well, it's that primary peritoneal that we talked about. So it's less than 1%, but it's not zero. So, so that's what it is. It starts in the peritoneum. Um, again, it presents like, behaves like, and we treat it like ovarian cancer, including the roles for surgery, the roles for chemotherapy, the role for HIPEC, uh, and PARP inhibitors as well. And then I think the other important difference between BRCA2 and BRCA1 is uh, with BRCA1, you don't have an increased risk of uterine or endometrial cancer, but if you develop a uterine or endometrial cancer and you carry the BRCA1 mutation, you have an increased risk of it being a more aggressive subtype called a serous uterine cancer. And so that was kind of discovered by Noah Koff was with me at Sloan Kettering many years ago. And it's really changed the way we counsel our patients. So, um, you know, if you're a little bit older and you carry BRCA1 mutation, um, it may not be unreasonable to, at the time of risk reducing surgery to not only remove the tubes and the ovaries, but also remove the uterus um, to eliminate the small but known increased risk of developing a serous endometrial cancer, which tends to be more aggressive and could be more challenging to treat. And so going back to the one thing that I would leave patients with about, um, you know, ovarian cancer screening or just in general, and one of the things we didn't talk about with survivorship, but it's a really important thing is sexual health uh, and something that nobody wants to really talk about, right? Patients sometimes are embarrassed, especially my little Hispanic ladies. Uh, doctors are embarrassed to talk about it. Um, so we just don't say anything. Uh, but it's so important. Women with GYN cancer, over 95% experience some kind of sexual dysfunction. Uh, and that can be mental. Um, that can be physical from the surgery they had or from the radiation treatment to that area. Um, but we don't talk about it. And obviously that has a huge impact on your quality of life and your survivor uh, and getting you back to regular life. So uh, this kind of ties into one thing I would say is be your own advocate. So if it's on your mind that you're having sexual health issues and you don't feel comfortable talking about it with your doctor, uh, maybe send them an email about it. It'd be easier to put it in writing and maybe say it face to face, or maybe you don't feel comfortable talking to your doctor or maybe he or she doesn't feel comfortable talking to you about it. 
We have great sexual health professionals. And this is what they do that we can refer patients to. Um, and they, this is all they do. So they can take a little bit more time than your average oncologist to talk to you about sexual health techniques and things to make sure that that's better. It's such an important thing of your life that patients don't want to talk about it. And a lot of times doctors, we don't know how to handle those kinds of questions. And this kind of ties in, be your own advocate. If you're not feeling well and you're telling your doctor and you don't feel that your doctor is responding to you or paying you attention, uh, then you need to be your own advocate and either demand that they pay attention to you or find another doctor that will listen. This is your health uh, and you need to be your own advocate. So the challenge with ovarian cancer, as Tracy stated, was we don't have any way for early screening. And when I was a medical student, it used to be known as the silent killer. Uh, it doesn't have symptoms, but if you tell that to a group of ovarian cancer survivors, they will tell you, I had a lot of symptoms, just nobody listened. Uh, and so they're kind of vague symptoms and it's hard sometimes to put your finger on it. But if you know your body best and if you're not feeling well, be your own advocate, push, get that ultrasound. Let's figure out what's going on. Um, because if you don't speak up, um, you know, it could be missed and perhaps an opportunity to catch these things when it's easier to treat um, could be missed. So if I can leave with anything, it's be your own advocate. Um, groups like BRCA Strong that help support women and men get BRCA, but women and support funding. Uh, they're great doctors here in South Florida. And so we have to find those doctors and, and put them in touch uh, with patients so we can improve outcomes for everybody. So Tracy, as always, thank you so much for, for setting these things up. I uh, hope that's what you guys wanted to hear. Uh, and thanks again for the opportunity. No, thanks so much. I see a lot of women are saying thank you, Dr. Diaz. Great seeing you. Always great to have you on and so informative and they really appreciate your feedback. And, you know, when I set this up, I knew it would kind of tag a different audience than we normally do because we talk about BRCA, but I really wanted, again, to, you know, get information out there on ovarian cancer survivorship as you and I talk about. It's so important. And just continue the conversation. Let's just Knowledge is power, right? We're here to educate, and you guys take it and be your own advocate. So thank you again. And I see, when would you talk about endometrial survivor? But we talked about endometrial this week, but we did not talk about endometrial survivorship. So Dr. Diaz, that's another topic to have in the future. Um, I'm sure Dr. Absolutely. Diaz would be happy to talk about it. <laughs> and so, we have a great survivorship program here at the Mamie Cancer Institute. All of my patients get referred to it. And it comes to me like, well, John, why are you sending me there? And I tell them, you know, our interactions are going to be kind of based around, you know, how are you doing? How are you respond to your chemo treatments? This is when your next scan is going to be. They're more cancer centric, which is not to say we're going to not address other issues that may come up. Uh, but sometimes patients don't know what it should bring. So our survivorship clinic addresses a lot of these things. Life after a diagnosis of cancer, the cognitive things that come with it. And so it's a great great clinic uh, that our patients really enjoy. And I think also it gives our patients some of the things to maybe bring up when they come to their visits to address with us. So um, again, be your own advocate. Um, if you haven't seen a survivorship clinic, something we do offer here and we can put you in contact with them. And it's definitely an amazing program coming from like an outsider that has got in. It's definitely an amazing program on even from a provider perspective, how they make you feel so welcome and want to get you through every step of the program. I never even knew about half of the programs that you guys offered until last week, and I was truly blown away, and I've signed up for five. So ladies, <laughs> look into them, see your options, and know your options. And thanks again so much, Dr. Diaz. We'll catch up soon. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye.